Um, so I, I just talked to IT. Uh, they were up here before the lecture, and they confirmed that we can't dim the light. So it's not like we were crazy last, uh, last time on Monday. It's literally not a feature yet. It's coming soon, so once we have the ability to dim the lights, it, it's always weird. We have all this great technology. This room's been renovated, and it looks awesome. Uh, um, most of you never saw what it was before this, but this was just renovated, so this is all brand new tech here. But we lose the ability to dim lights, one of the simplest things. So unfortunately, that's how tech goes a lot of the time. Uh, so once we have the ability to dim the lights, we'll be able to do that. But I think we can see this fine. We just don't get the, that nice atmosphere. Is the only thing we're missing out on. So today is the first day of some content. We're going to dive headfirst into Scala. I'm just going to uh, jump into that. Well, at least when we get to the slides, that mouse is not connected to my laptop. Uh, a few things first. The first assignment is released. I, I don't have the grader up in Autolab yet. Autolab will still give you a 500 error when you try to go there. It's because I haven't uploaded the roster. I just don't have anything set up there yet. Uh, I will do that shortly. I, had, uh, I was going to do it yesterday and hit uh, uh, an embarrassing technical slag in that I deleted my old stuff and I didn't have it ready. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's my life that I got to deal with. Um, so once I get the, the grader, I got to redo a bit of work there. Once I get the grader live, then uh, I'll upload the roster to Autolab and you'll be able to submit and get feedback on your assignment. Uh, this is posted. Uh, I will go to that document and, and say some things about it. Uh, but first, I want to show you the lab stuff. Oh, no, I don't have it. This is why. <laughs> this is why I opened these tabs before because I figured I wouldn't have Wi-Fi. I'd have to fight against the Wi-Fi. Uh, I didn't open that tab. Uh, but once you do have Wi-Fi, once you have internet, you can check out the first two labs. Uh, an outline of those. Uh, the lab next week. There's no lab this week. I had that question a few times. So I want to make sure that's explicit. Lab next week is going to be IntelliJ setup. A lot of you are having trouble just getting IntelliJ setup, which is more painful than I think it should be. It, we go through this every semester in 116. It, it sucks, uh, you know, getting it set up for 250 students. It's kind of a pain. Uh, so I set aside an entire lab. We have a full two hours with each of you to get everything set up, everything running, getting JDK 15, Scala 2.13 getting everything set up so you can run all the code this semester. We do make sure that you have the right versions, those two versions of things, because with those two versions, you'll be able to do everything for the rest of the semester. Uh, we've had semesters where we just said, get anything running, and then halfway through the semester, once we use new libraries and new things, new features of the language, uh, we have to go through that setup again. So we only have to go through this once, ideally, you know, preferably. Um, and we're going to get everyone through it by the end of week two, Everyone's going to have IntelliJ set up, and we won't have to worry about that again. Then we just focus on learning CSE concepts. The week after that, we're going to do Project One Primer, which is dedicated to getting you started on Project One. So Project One's out. You can see what the requirements are. You can start coding on it. You just can't submit to Autolab and get your feedback yet. Hopefully by, the, by next lecture, we'll have the grader up. The first assignment, Pale Blue Dot, I'll just give a quick Introduction. I won't go. I won't belabor the point here. Um, but you're going to get data on cities and countries in two separate data files. You have to parse through these files, extract the information, and then process that information in your program. So uh, you'll have one file for the names of countries based on their country code, and another file, which is the one you'll spend the most time in, giving you the latitude and longitude location of a city based on the city name, the city's country, by their two-digit country code, and that city's region, which, uh, for example, for the United States, the region would be the state, and also the population of that city as an integer. Given that data, we want to process that and then extract some nice information about the cities on this planet. And that's broken down into six lecture objectives. So just a recap, uh, just because my grading structure is uh, a bit different than other courses, I'll do a little recap here. There are six lecture objectives. If you complete all six lecture objectives, you've completed the right portion of that learning objective, learning objective one. So there are six lecture objectives. Each time, each lecture, each 
lecture objective is tied to a lecture, the lecture where I present the information that you need to complete that lecture objective. So today's lecture is going to introduce lecture objective one, which is converting degrees to radians. Pretty straightforward function. It's just meant to uh, help you get up to speed with Scala and also testing, which we'll talk about uh, next week. We'll start talking about next week. So lecture objective one, you'll be able to do the functionality after today's lecture, and then the testing after a lecture next week. Then at the bottom, there are two application objectives. These, this is where you'll earn your application objectives where you're like, okay, I'm passing the class. Now I want to start working towards the A. These are the objectives to be able to do that. So two application objectives, six lecture objectives. You have to complete the six lecture objectives. And if you want to improve your grade, you complete the two application objectives. Any questions on any of that? I realize I don't have uh, Discord open. Let me get that. Oh, I'm not going to have Wi-Fi in this. Hopefully, it can go through my mobile data, but I guess you'll have trouble chatting in there also. Um, but I will be watching Discord on my phone when I uh, remember to glance at it. I want to eventually set up on the screen. I'll have to show up like 20 minutes early to a lecture and mess around with that um, and make sure I have that all set up. When will point of sale be out? Um, not for a while. Uh, I'll, my goal is to release each homework assignment before the Monday of the first lecture for that assignment. So point of sale, um, that first Monday, like right underneath point of sale where it is on the schedule, that Monday, I want it released, at least the document released by then, by the time I start the con content for that. So like Pale Blue Dot, I wanted it released today because now is when I'm starting the content for Pale Blue Dot. So there's no guarantee that you'll get that um, early. Yeah, no labs this week, but labs next week. Labs will start next week. We, we usually don't have labs week two in fall semesters because we have Labor Day, but we lucked out and don't have any Monday labs in this section. Uh, so we, we can have that extra lab where we help you set up IntelliJ, where usually that lab, instead of having that in lab, we just have it in office hours, fire up office hours and say, go to some office hours if you're having trouble setting up IntelliJ. Now we have a nice scheduled two hour block of time to help you, 25 at a time to make sure our IntelliJ is set up. All right, there are no more questions. Let's start talking about Scala. So the first few lectures, uh, we're going to take the effectively the 115 content and show you Scala. These lectures are going to go fast. The content will go fast. My assumption is that you already, excuse me, that you already know the 115 concepts. You already know like what a loop is, what a conditional is, what a data structure is, what a list is, what a map is. You already know all that stuff. Uh, my goal in these lectures is just to show you here's the Scala syntax for those things. So there's not much hardcore technical content here. You're just learning the syntax and getting comfortable with the language. But I still want these lectures in here because I want to give you some time uh, to study, uh, study this stuff. And mostly most of this, especially when it's just syntax, is getting your hands on it, getting your hands on the lecture, lecture tests and or lecture objectives, and just getting practice with the syntax. So you're warmed up by the time we get to the real, uh, the tougher content, the more technical content. So with that, let's start talking about Scala. Lecture objective one is converting degrees to radians. There's no tricks with this one. The, the function is right here. The radians is going to be the degrees, so whatever the input is. Multiply that by pi and divide it by 180. Just in case uh, you're, you're, you're misremembering the, the formula, I don't want anyone stuck on the math part of this. So there's the equation. That's what you need to do for this function. You'll get degrees as an input, multiply it by pi, divide it by 180, and return that thing. So that's all you need to do for that one. But it's, this is IntelliJ setup. This is uh, cloning the repo. This is uh, just getting everything set up to be able to work on a question uh, is, is this one. When you're done, when you're ready to submit to Autolab, IntelliJ has an option to export as a zip file. So export your entire project as a zip, and then upload that zip to Autolab. And then Autolab will take it from there. It'll unzip it, it'll find your project files, and grade your submission. For this question, make sure you use pi 
don't use 3.14. So my testing is going to check that to make sure you didn't use an estimate of pi. You do have to have some pretty good precision on this. There's a, a pretty uh, simple way to do that in Scala and in most, most languages. You do math.pi and that will give you pi out to as much precision as a double will allow. Uh, so don't use 3.14. If you use 3.14 and come to office hours saying why am I passing this test, we're going to be like, is that actually pi? No, it's just an estimate. And that's how that conversation will go. So let's start where we always start. Hello world. Here's our first Scala program that will print hello world to the screen. It's a bit more complicated. There's a bit more overhead than Python and JavaScript, which is why we save this, uh, which is why we don't throw something like Scala at you semester one. We used to start with Java. The, uh, the AP computer science still starts with Java, and the first hello world is something like this. And I don't know, it's a little convoluted, I think, for your first time. You're ready for something like this now. So let's talk about what the pieces are of this program. So you can identify the print line hello Scala. That's what's actually being ran, that's the code that's doing the stuff that we care about. But what's all this other stuff around it? Clicking doesn't advance my slide. Um, first, the package declaration. This is specifying the package of code where, uh, where this file lives. Basically, and mostly if, if uh, you're following a good organization, this package declaration should match the directory structure of your project. So there should be a file named src, and then a directory named lo1 program execution, and then a directory named scala, and then a file named hello.scala. So the package declaration can be thought of as the directory where this file lives. There's a little bit of difference between a directory and a package. You, they don't have to match, but they should. Anyone who's familiar with Java, they do have to match in Java. In Scala, they remove that restriction, uh, but really, you should still follow it. Anyway, uh, you can think of that as a, a directory where it lives. And in the homework assignments, each objective will start with write this code in this package with this class or object name. So you do have to get those packages, uh, packages correct. In IntelliJ, if you create a package, it'll create the directory and keep that in line for you. But every Scala file is going to start with a package declaration. Um, technically, if you don't, it'll be in the default package. Um, but everything that we'll see is going to start with a package declaration. Next, it still doesn't advance my slide. Next is creating either an object or a class. For now, they're all going to be objects until we learn what classes are. Next is going to be an object declaration, which creates a container for all of the code that we're going to have. Objects can store variables and functions. And whenever a function is part of an object, we call it a method. So we have variables and methods inside of this object. And everything in Scala has to be contained in an object. Everything in Scala is an object. Everything, all of your code, everything except your package declarations and your imports are going to be inside an object. And later on, will be inside classes which create objects. So we have to have an object declaration. We can name this whatever we want. The name should match the file name that, uh, of this code. So this object named hello should be in a file named hello.scala in the directory specified by the package. And we tend to put all of our source code in a directory named src, short for source. That's where our source code goes, in, at least in the directory structure that we'll use in this class that I'll show in the examples and how the projects are set up, uh, which is standard practice. Then we have this, our first Scala method. This is what we call a main method. This is where your program starts. Every program you write is going to start with a main method. This is where, this is how Scala knows where to start running code. Your programs are going to start at the beginning of a main method, run all of your code, 
until it hits the end of your main method. At that point, the program is over and uh, execution stops. So the main method is where all of our code is going to go. In most, most, most cases, the main method is going to call other methods and uh, go over to other objects to actually do what our program is designed to do. And we'll have very little code in any main methods that we write, but this is where control starts. This is where everything starts for your program. The main method has to have exactly this header. The only thing that can change is this name. This is a variable name, so you can change that to whatever you want. Uh, by default, we always call it args. Those are the command line arguments, not something we'll mess with in this class. Uh, but if you, somebody's running this program from the command line, they can add arguments there. And that's where those arguments will show up. Even when we don't use that, we have to have all of this. If you don't want to think about what that is, you don't have to, but just for those of you who are interested, I'll go through it real quick here. Def, which we will see in a few slides, create, says this is going to be a method. Main, that's the name of the method, all lowercase letters. One parameter, which is an array of strings, and return type unit, which we'll talk about parameters and return types and types in general in a few slides as well. If you have exactly this, a method named main that takes an array of strings and returns unit, exactly that with lowercase m-a-i-n, then Scala recognizes that and says, ooh, that's a main method. It's a very special type of method where the program starts. If anything's different, if this returns an int, if it takes an array of ints uh, or doubles, if it's called main with a capital M, if anything is different, Scala's not gonna know to start your program there. It has to be exactly like this. And finally, our actual program, which doesn't do anything interesting for this example. It's the first example, what do you want from me? It just prints hello Scala to the screen. Okay, now that you've seen your first Scala program, any questions? And I am in the Discord, if anybody wants to chat in the lecture channel. There's one message since the start that says no internet sad face. So even if you wanna post, unless you wanna use uh, mobile data. I'm reading it with mobile data right now because I don't have internet either. Uh, by the way, the internet, it, it's just kind of a, a semesterly thing. The first week of the semester, the internet is like always down. It's just, I don't know. It's something I've learned to live with. It, it, you know, we, we just uh, deal with it. We expect it. Uh, after the first week, the internet comes back and it's, uh, it hums along really good the rest of the semester, historically speaking anyway. Uh, the, the first week, you know, everyone's still showing up to classes and everybody's using the Wi-Fi, so it tends to bog down the first week. Uh, but as people start dropping classes and, and, uh, and other things, um, in IT, I don't know, maybe they do things each, uh, maybe they're surprised by this each semester, I don't know, I don't think so. But anyway, the Wi-Fi usually does pick up the second week. So it's just something we live with the first week, unfortunately. We need to import, so that's not a package import, that's def defining which package this code lives in. So if somebody else wanted to import this code, they would say import LO1 program execution dot scala slash, or dot hello. So you need that package declaration of what you want to import. The packages are how, how you find what you want to import, or how other people find the code that they want to import. If you wrote code that somebody else wants to import, or you want to import code from across your project, the full package declaration and object or class name. That's how you're going to import it. Uh, th that's the most important part of package declarations. It's how other files can find your code or other packages. Code in other packages can find your code. So the package declaration. Hello, Scala. Uh, but every program you write will contain a package declaration because every objective that I write and every homework assignment starts with in this package write this class or object. So, uh, so your files will all start with a package declaration. All right, let's talk about methods and variables. So let's look at our second program. Now we have the, the basic structure of a Scala program. Let's expand on that and start blazing through uh, modules one and two in 115. I think we'll get through, I think we'll get through like 
at least module one today and then module two on Friday, I believe is uh, how I have this laid out. And then, uh, and then on Wednesday, we start new 116 content. So let's take a look at this program. Without knowing any Scala or anything, you can probably figure out what this does, not just because I tell you right there on the screen, but you could read through this. I, I'm confident that uh, any one of you could do that, where now that you know we start at the main, we have some x that equals 7. We're going to call multiply by 2, which is going to multiply it by 2, and then print out 14. Uh, but there's a lot of Scala syntax that's brand new to you. And it's the syntax I want to focus on, and mostly the concept of strong typing. This is a brand new thing that, uh, that you don't have to do in Python or JavaScript. You don't worry too much about the types of your variables in uh, Python or, did I say Scala and JavaScript? With Python and JavaScript, you don't have to think too much about the types of your variables. In Scala, you absolutely must know the types of your variables because you have to tell Scala the types of your variables. So here's our first method declaration. We use the keyword def. We use the keyword def to say, hey, Scala, I'm about to define a, a function or define a uh, uh, method, which is the same, happens to be the same keyword in Python or in JavaScript, it would be function, the keyword function. Def is serving that same purpose. The name of the function, here I named it multiply by two. That you can name your functions, whatever you want, or your methods rather, whatever you want. Of course, for the homework assignments, I'm going to say write a method named whatever because my auto grader has to find your code. I'm going to find it by name. So here I name this multiply by two because it's a nice description of what this does. And then when we take an input, the, our parameter list, which just has one parameter for this example with, named input, we have to specify the type. So this isn't a method that takes one parameter. This is a method that takes one parameter which has to be a double. So when I say the type is a double, which we specify with a colon, we say the name of the variable, colon, and then the type of the variable, we're saying, hey, Scala, if anybody wants to call this method, they sure as hell better give me a double. If they don't give me a double, go yell at them and tell them they can't do that. And if I try to call this method, with say a string, Scala is going to do exactly that. The compiler is going to say, you can't do that. That method takes a double. You gave it a string. Fix your code or else I'm not touching it. And it will not run the program if you use the wrong type. This is what we call strong typing. Every variable has a type, a fixed type that it has to comply with. And then variables can only store values of that type. So this input, this parameter, has to be a double, and when I call this method later, I have to give it a double. Likewise, every method has a return type. The return type comes after the parameter list. There's another colon, and then the return type. So this is saying this method will return a double. So whenever this method is called and it returns a value, that will be a double and we can only do things with it that we can do with doubles. When we store that in a variable or whatever we're doing with the return value, it's guaranteed to be a double, so we have to handle it as a double. Likewise, our method here has a contract now. As soon as we put return type double, Scala's going to say, okay, you're telling me you're returning a double. You sure as hell better return a double. If you don't return a double in every instance of that method, in every possible execution of that method, Scott's going to be like, hey, you told me that's returning a double, but it's not always returning a double. What gives, man? What's going on? Fix your stuff. Fix your code. You'll get red underlines under your code, and they'll say, fix this. Uh, and you've got to make sure your, what you're returning matches that return type. You have to comply with the types, and you have to explicitly specify your types uh, in most cases. There is one, one part here where I'm not specifying my type I'll talk about. Uh, for methods, you absolutely have to specify your types. And then finally, the, uh, the body of the method. So everything in between the braces is what's going to execute when this method is called. The big thing here for Scala, you'll notice there's no return statement. You've seen return statements in Python and JavaScript. That's how you say 
hey method, you're done executing, return this value. Scala, no such thing. There actually is a return keyword in Scala, you can add it, but it is strongly discouraged. The Scala community really prefers no returns. Uh, it can really mess up control flow when you get uh, deep into methods. If you have a return statement like in the middle of your method, uh, which we do sometimes, uh, it can really, it can really mess things up and it can uh, really confuse the compiler and eliminate a lot of efficiencies that you could otherwise have um, once, uh, once you have that return statement. Instead, the last expression that's evaluated during the execution of the method is the return value. So no matter what happens in your method, whatever the last statement that was executed, that's what's returned. Whatever that, uh, whatever that um, expression, I think I said statement, expression, whatever that expression evaluates to, that's your return value. So here we only have one line here. We have a multiplication, uh, we have a multiplication expression, input times two. So whatever input times two resolves to, that's the return value. There's only one expression that's evaluated in this entire method. So of course that's what's going to be returned. Declaring variables that are not parameters works the same way, except we're using the keyword bar. There's a, there are two different keywords we can use to declare variables, bar and val. Actually, my next example will use a val which are the same as let and const in JavaScript. Var is creating a variable, um, val is creating a value, which is the same as a const. It's a value that cannot change, it is not variable. Uh, var, I'm creating a variable, I'm gonna name it x, and then using that same syntax we saw before, a colon, and then specify the type of that variable. I'm creating a variable of type double, so this variable named x, can only ever, throughout its entire lifetime, can only store doubles. It has to store a double. If you try to put something other than a double in there, it's just not gonna work. Uh, there are some specific cases, like if you uh, have some int and you try to put that in x, store that in the variable x, uh, that will let you do that, but only because Scala behind the scenes is converting that int to a double for you, because that's something that it can do. Because uh, there, there are ways to convert that, which won't break anything. You can always convert an int to a double without losing any information. And uh, it'll do that automatically behind the scenes. Otherwise, got to be a double. You can't say x equals some string. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Your types have to match. The values in a variable have to match the type of that variable. And we're gonna kinda break a few things that I've been saying. Now, I'll try to add my type declarations everywhere, every example I show you, just to make sure everything's nice and clear. Uh, there are a few examples where, where I don't have them, and uh, we can talk about those when we get there. But this, I do wanna show you at least one example early on where I don't have a type. I'm creating a variable, I'm naming it result, but I'm not explicitly specifying the type of result. This is valid code, this runs, this executes, everything's perfectly fine with this. Because Scala does do some work for us. It's looking ahead, it's saying, okay, you created a variable named result, that's what you want. Let me put that aside first and figure out what's over on the right-hand side of this assignment operator. And it says, oh, it's a method, multiply by two. Whatever multiply by two gives me, you're gonna store it in that variable. Okay, well, you told me multiply by two has to return a double which is a set in stone contract. It does have to return a double. So since that method has to return a double, Scala will infer that that variable type then must be a double. So it's a way that Scala's saving us just some typing. Uh, so for an educational environment like this, I like to always specify my types um, instead of just saving some keystrokes. Uh, but this is valid Scala, so if you forget your types and it still works, don't be like, Jesse lied to me. No, that's, that's a feature of the language. Um, but it's, uh, at least in this class, I'm going to discourage it. Get your types in there so you know exactly what the type is. And sometimes Scala will infer a type that you don't expect, uh, which uh, can make things, get things a little messy, uh, and then really jam up your program down the road. So it's, it's discouraged, but you know, outside of an academic environment, once you're uh, seasoned developers out there, you know, you don't have to specify your types all the time. 
And then print the result to the screen, the next line. And my phone falls asleep in like a minute. All right, any questions on variables and methods? Yeah. Any variable can only have one type, but you can have several variables with different types. Like I could have, I could have var y of type string after that. But like x is always going to be a double, and x can't have two types. And what about for the uh, functions? Can the result be two multiple No, only one. We can only have one, one type there. Uh, as we'll see later, we can have that type be a type of a class that we defined which contains multiple variables. So we can like group up variables together. Or it can be a data structure with like a million elements in it, uh, but it can only have one return type. But that type might be a pretty complex type, as we'll see later in the semester. Uh, in unit, we'll talk about this Friday when we talk more, uh, get in more detail about some specific types. Unit is effectively the lack of a type. Uh, if you've seen Java, it's the same as void in Java. Um, unit just means this method doesn't return anything. Don't look for a return value. Yeah, you do have to have a return type. So the, the unit would, does have to be there. If you don't return anything, you do have to specify a return type. The return type is just unit. All right, let's take a look at another example. I always forget with the, uh, with the 20 minutes between classes, I always forget when classes end. We start at 1.50, so it would be 2.40, okay. Uh, so let's let, take a look at another program. Again, I'm confident that you could read through this code and figure out what it does, even if I don't put the answer on the screen. But we gotta talk about the Scala syntax, and there's one very specific trick that I'm using here that I, I wanna highlight. It's the reason I use this example. It's one of the biggest uh, kind of things that trips up students early in the semester. So I definitely want to talk about this. All right, first, I mentioned this on the earlier slide because I, I just couldn't hold it back. I was so excited about it. Val is uh, similar to var, except it's a value instead of a variable, meaning that it's just one single value that cannot ever change. You cannot ch uh, change vales. So the value large of type double is always going to have the value 60. It's always going to represent the value 60 and that cannot change. If later in this code you try to do large equals 90, you're gonna get an error, the code's not gonna run, Scala's gonna shut you down real quick. These, uh, these values, large and medium, always have to store those values and they'll never change. Uh, and whenever you have a value that you don't expect to change, it's usually better to use val for one, you'll get some optimizations out of it, but since the compiler knows it'll never change, uh, there's some extra things, fancy stuff that it can do to make sure uh, that you get the most efficiency out of that and most performance, uh, but also so you have a guarantee that it won't change. If you know that those aren't supposed to change, but then later on writing your method, you forget that or you're working with somebody else and uh, like out there in, in the industry or an internship, uh, and they try to change it, the compiler's gonna enforce that and be like, yo, you told me earlier that that wasn't gonna change and now you're trying to change it. It gets the compiler to help you out and work for you by uh, notifying you like, hey, you said that wasn't gonna change and now you're trying to change it. You can go, oh yeah, I, I didn't want that to change. That would've broke everything if I changed it. But if you use var for everything, you don't get that help. Uh, so it's always better to use val if you don't expect it to change. And again, we're using the same syntax for the type. The types are doubles, and then we're setting them equal to some nice double literals. And then next big new thing here is a conditional. The syntax here, just like JavaScript, uh, so, so nothing really brand new there. We have ifs, we have else ifs, we have else's, and they work just the way that you would expect them to work from 115. You're gonna check the first conditional. If this is true, you're gonna run this block of code. If it's false, you're gonna check the next condition. If that's true, you run this block of code. And if that's also false, you run this block of code. 
And since I have an else, exactly one of these pieces of code are going to be executed. And the code is just string literals. I just have string literals floating out there, uh, which aren't doing much. This method returns a string. So I have to guarantee Scala, or Scala is going to hold me to this, that this method will return a string. It has to return a string. But again, I don't have any return statement. Like it's, it's not super clear what's going on here, how that's being returned. So no matter which path, the trick here is that no matter which path we're taking through this conditional, whether we're running this code, this code, or this code, the last expression that's evaluated in this method is always just a string literal. The string literal just evaluates to itself, uh, which is an expression. So we're always evaluating a string literal, an expression that evaluates to a string as the last expression of this method, no matter what the input is. So the conditional is actually controlling what's going to be returned, specifically because the conditional is the last block of code in this method. So if I had anything after this conditional, I would break my functionality because I wouldn't get the large, medium, or small returned the way I want to. This also depends on having an else, and this is the one that, that trips a lot of students up early in the semester. If you don't have an else, say this was another else if input greater than equal, uh, sorry, else, else if input less than medium. If I did that, it'd effectively be the same logic as having an else. The big difference is that Scala isn't going to trust you. Scala's not gonna say, look at that, do all the, the logical reasoning and say, yes, the, all those options are comprehensive. You will always be returning a string literal, so you're good. No, no. What Scala's gonna say is, you don't have an else statement that evaluates to a string, so I can't guarantee that this method will always evaluate to a string. Because if your if is false, your else if is false, and your next else if, again, assuming that we change this to else if input less than medium, if that's also false, we're not evaluating to a string, and Scala's gonna say, you told me you were returning a string, but you're not returning a string, and then you look at your method and you say, it's always going to return a string, what's going on here? It's because Scala needs to see that else if you're using this trick where the last thing that happens in your method is a conditional, and you're using that to control the return value. If you wanna avoid that, you can, just, uh, you can just set this up differently. Have a variable, you know, set large, medium, or small to that variable, and then return the variable at the end of the conditional. And you can get around that if you don't wanna end your method with a conditional like this. Uh, but my point of this, this example is that you, the return value is not always the last line of code in your method it can be controlled by the control flow of your program, uh, like I did here. Uh, but you do have to guarantee Scala that no matter what, you are returning something. So for example, we can't do the same thing with a loop uh, because we can't guarantee that that loop will execute. Uh, which brings us back to the lecture objectives. My first and last slide are almost always the lecture objective, just so you can remember what, what we're at. Uh, I do have one more slide here, though. We're gonna go into some project se uh, setup demo. I wasn't sure if I had time to get this in this lecture, but let's get into IntelliJ and see a live example of this working. As with any live example, there's the potential that it'll crash and burn, especially because I just installed IntelliJ like an hour ago, and now, I say that's a benefit because I want to show you a, a complete run of getting this set up. So for those of you who have tried this, which I did on purpose, obviously, I, I could have brought my other laptop that was all set up and not done it. I want to start with a fresh install. Um, so a lot of you have had trouble with JDK 15 installing that. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to highlight while I go through this demo. Uh, if you haven't started installing IntelliJ at all, like do that immediately, do that, well, we don't have Wi-Fi right now, but as soon as you have Wi-Fi, download and install IntelliJ. I strongly recommend 
installing IntelliJ Ultimate. You can get a free EDU license. I got the links on the website. Um, but I think the way the course is structured now, you can get away with IntelliJ Community. Um, but if you go get the educational license and get Ultimate, then you know you're covered. Plus, you get a lot, uh, a lot of extra features that you may or may not want. OK, so the first thing, when you open IntelliJ, you're going to get a window similar to this. I created one project so um, just to make sure I wasn't going to completely crash and burn in lecture. Um, but you'll see a little bit different screen, which will have new project open and get from B uh, version control, which will be bigger buttons, just because it has the room to do that. You want to go to new project, at least just to test this out. We'll clone from, uh, from version control as well. I can't because I don't have Wi-Fi, so we'll start a new project right here. Uh, you'll clone the examples repo next week and then and the project when you're ready to start the project from version control and download it from the internet. We'll start a new project. You want to find Scala and Idea and create a new Scala project. When you first install IntelliJ, Scala will probably not be an option. It won't be in this sidebar. So what we want to do is go to plugins Search for Scala. Is this big enough? Oh, yeah, I don't have internet. <laughs> well, good thing I installed that before I left. Uh, and in Marketplace, there will be a list. You can search for Scala, and this will come up. It will be the first result. You want to install the Scala plugin. Man, that would have been the end of the demo if, <laughs> if I didn't do that earlier. Uh, so we want to install the Scala plugin. It'll ask you to restart the ID. IntelliJ will restart, and when it pops back up, then you should have an option for Scala in this sidebar. And then pick Idea. You can, you know, for your own purposes, you can use the other options here. But Idea, that's going to create a project with the structure that I'll use for all the homework assignments, all the projects. Uh, that'll set up a source directory for you. I'll call this lecture. And uh, in the same way that you'll see for the projects. And then you'll get some options here. I'm testing this. Uh, this thing, I'll explain this right now. So this is where we need to set up the JDK. We need JDK 15 and Scala 13.6. Scala is pretty easy. These won't be here when you first run it. So you go to Create, Download, 2.13.6. Make sure you get that version of Scala. You click that. You click OK. It's going to say you don't have internet right now, but that will download Scala set everything up for you, and Scala's set up. Super easy. Unfortunately, the JDK is not quite as easy. There is a download JDK option, which, of course, I don't have internet, so it won't even pop up the list. But there is a download JDK option. I'm testing out, and some of the TAs have tested out, this Azul Zulu Community version 15.0.4. Uh, this one might work for the course. If that one does work, then uh, you know, we'll update some documentation, especially for lab next week. And you can try to run, uh, run that one for the course. I want to test it and make sure it's going to work for everything that we do all semester before I uh, really endorse that. Um, if we, that doesn't work, you have to go to Oracle's website, download uh, OpenJDK 15, which makes you create an account. It's kind of a pain in the butt. It makes you create an account. You download it. It installs. And then you have to find where it installed to and then link it using add JDK here. So once we have everything set up, we're going to have a project like this. We're going to have an SRC folder, which is where all our code is going to go. From here, we can create new packages. So if I want to create a new package, new package, I'll just name this lecture. And that's going to create the directory and the package for me. And if I want to create my first program, I'm going to go to New, Scala Class. From this drop down, I'm going to create an object and give it a really original name. And when I do this in the ID, the ID is going to do a lot of the work for me here. It's going to give me my package declaration, it's going to give me my object name, is there an easy way to make this bigger? 
It's going to give me my object name and set things up for me. And then there's a nice shorthand that we can do that again, IntelliJ is going to help us out with. Remember that main method? We had to remember, okay, it's def main, was it lowercase capital? I don't know. I mean, I do know, but. In the IDE, we just type main, enter, and it's going to fill all that in for me so I don't have to memorize that whole main method. And at this point, we can start typing our Scala code. which I'm not going to do much here. And then once we have our program set, we can run this in a few different ways. We either click the green arrow here or here, or we go to our code over here, right click it and go to run. That's going to run our code and we should see 7.0 print to the screen. 7.0, yay, we have a Scala program running. So that's how you can set up, configure your Scala programs. And if I had internet, I'd show you Maven, but I can't quite do that. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so have a good day, and I'll see everyone Friday.